Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to my guide to Pandemonium Asphodelos' first circle on the normal difficulty. If you'd like to skip to any specific mechanic, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. The boss you'll contend with here is Erythonios. At the start, you'll have plenty of time to get familiar with the basics here. Speaking of which, don't touch the wall. It's death. Jailer's Flail is the first mechanic you'll see, and this will have the boss pull out a chain and begin spinning it on either his left or right side. When the cast bar finishes, he will hit that side of the room with a large AoE. Just stand on the side opposite to the one with the spinning chain. He'll often do this attack twice in a row, alternating each side, so you'll just alternate sides as well. More basics, Warder's Wrath is room-wide damage to mitigate and heal, of course, while Heavy Hand is a tank buster. Just keep an eye on these and respond accordingly. Erythonios also has Pitiless Flail, a line AoE he'll aim at a player other than the current tank. If that player moves, the AoE will follow, so it's easier to just let everyone move away from you if you're the one selected. When the cast bar finishes, anyone hit will be knocked back. Knockback resist does work on this, but otherwise stand close to the boss so you don't get flung into the wall. After Pitiless Flail is True Holy, which is just split damage, so group up and heal like you would for any other split attack. Now with the basics done, Erythonios has two major mechanics he will alternate between for the rest of the fight. The first is Intemperance. This will mark every player with either a fire or ice debuff, overloading them with that element. The arena will also be split into four quadrants with a thick cross AoE between all of them. Each quadrant has a pillar of elemental cubes. One by one, starting from the bottom, the pillars will explode and hit their individual quadrants with that element. Your goal is to just always get hit by the opposite element. If you get hit by the same one, it'll overload you and be a bad time. Marked with fire, get hit by ice, and vice versa. You can also freely move around the room before the explosions go off too, so don't feel confined to one part. However, if you are on the cross that separates the quadrants when they explode, that will be instant death. The second big mechanic is Shining Cells. This will do sizable damage to the entire party while also reducing the size of the arena to a circle. That circle will then be divided into several sections. These sections are either light or fire aspected, and you can tell just by looking at the floor. Whenever the boss casts Ether Chain, his next ability, he will be surrounded by either fire or light orbs. When the spell finishes casting, all sections that are the same element as the orbs will explode and damage anyone inside of them. Simply put, stand on the section that's opposite of the boss's orb type. It can be the same element multiple times in a row to mind you, so don't just keep reversing on a whim. Just look at the orbs. After a couple of Ether Chains, Erythonios will instead use Ether Flail. This has the orbs from Ether Chain while also performing a Jailer's Flail. All this means is you need to stand on the correct section based on the orb, but on the side of the boss where he isn't flailing, so not much more than you were doing before. After doing some Ether Flails and a Pitiless Flail, the boss will use Slam Shut. This ends the phase and does big damage to the party, so just mitigate this for sure. From this point on, the fight is just on repeat. The only real addition is a Jailer's Flail during Intemperance's third element explosion. 
This is actually kind of a bait though. The flail will not go off until after Intemperance fully resolves. But it's designed to kind of get you to panic and attempt to swap quadrants early and then you get caught in between. Just do your element mechanic like normal and then dodge the flail after this. There's plenty of time. From here on though, just keep repeating everything until Erethonios is defeated and you're all set. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned. We have the rest of the normal mode guides on the way. And of course, we got some savage guides coming when that comes out in a couple weeks. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video. And until then, take care.
Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to my guide to Pandemonium Asphodelo's second circle on the normal difficulty. If you'd like to skip to a specific mechanic, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. The boss you'll contend with here is the Hippocampus. This boss is omnidirectional, so don't worry about positionals here. Take note of the raised platforms and grates around the room, as you will need those shortly. Finally, don't touch the wall. Fall back. As the encounter begins, you'll need to know some basics. Murky Depths is a room one. AoE and Doubled Impact is a shared tank buster. Both tanks should pop a cooldown and share the damage here, though big cooldowns on a single tank is enough to survive. The next mechanic is an important one, Spoken Cataract. The Hippocampus has the ability to separate its head from its body, and it uses that to its advantage both here and in future mechanics. When this starts casting, the head and body will both display independent hitboxes with an arrow indicating the direction they are aiming. At the end of the cast bar, both parts will do their own AoE. The head will do a half room AoE, eliminating one entire side of the room. The body, on the other hand, will only hit about a third of the room through the center with a line AoE. Just process these one at a time. Get opposite of the direction the head is aiming, and then a few steps back from whichever direction the body is aiming. There's plenty of safe space once you recognize how they aim the AoEs. Two are going to happen back to back here, so get familiar with it here. Next is the Hippocampus's main mechanic, Sewage Deluge. The entire side of the room from its body, and it uses that to its advantage both here and in future mechanics. When this starts casting, the head and body will both display independent hitboxes with an arrow indicating the direction they are aiming. At the end of the cast bar, both parts will do their own AoE. The head will do a half room AoE, eliminating one entire side of the room. The body, on the other hand, will only hit about a third of the room through the center with a line AoE. Just process these one at a time. Get opposite of the direction the head is aiming, and then a few steps back from whichever direction the body is aiming. There's plenty of safe space once you recognize how they aim the AoEs. Two are going to happen back to back here, so get familiar with it here. Next is the Hippocampus's main mechanic, Sewage Deluge. This will do some room-wide damage and after a short delay, cover the majority of the room in water. The only safe locations here will be the raised platforms and the grates that connect them. Touching the water will just give you a dropsy dot. It does about 8k per tick, so it's survivable, but not ideal. For positioning here, I'd recommend letting the healers have the south center grate, with the DPS spread along the two southwest and southeast raised platforms. Tanks can use the north connecting grate and those raised platforms how they choose. It's not mandatory to set things up this way. In fact, there's definitely some better forms and the grates that connect them. Touching the water will just give you a dropsy dot. It does about 8k per tick, so it's survivable, but not ideal. For positioning here, I'd recommend letting the healers have the south center grate, with the DPS spread along the two southwest and southeast raised platforms. Tanks can use the north connecting grate and those raised platforms how they choose. It's not mandatory to set things up this way, in fact there's definitely some better ways to set it up, but at the very minimum, this helps for healing and mechanics a lot, if not everyone is super spread out in random places. Realistically, clock spots that teams often use in Savage Raids would be far better for this, and I'll keep that in mind when Savage releases, but for normal mode, I just can't expect that. During this phase are a number of mechanics that will test your use of the limited space. Tainted Flood is an AoE on 6 random players, so everyone just needs to spread. How you spread isn't so important, just don't stand a mile away from your healers. After this is Predatory Sight. This just gives every player a marker over their head, indicating they need to stack with at least one other person. It doesn't matter which teammate it is, just stand on top of any other teammate to avoid taking any damage from this. Finally for the first Sewage Deluge is Shockwave. This has the boss jump on one of the raised platforms and knock all players away from that location. Line yourself up with this to ensure it doesn't send you into the water, or worse, the wall, or just use knockback mitigation like Surecast at arm's length. This ends Sewage Deluge number one, but the Hippocampus is quick to introduce another new mechanic, Dissociation. This has the boss's current head separate and appear on the north side of the room. After a delay, it will do a half room size AoE, so everyone just needs to identify where the head is and get to the opposite side of the room during that mechanic. 
Next is Coherence. This places a proximity tank buster on one of the two tanks at random and a split damage AoE on one of the non-tank party members. The tank with the flare marker should just get away from the party closer to the wall and make sure they pop a cooldown for damage. The party on the other hand just needs to stack up and split the other AoE. The fall off damage on the proximity is very forgiving, so if the tank was at the very front of the hitbox and the rest of the party at the very back, then everyone can keep hitting the boss here. After another murky depths is Sewage Deluge number 2. This is different from the first one, but every deluge from this point on will be the same as this. After a tainted flood, the boss will begin using Spoken Cataract during the deluge. It works exactly the same, you just need to stay on the grates and raised platforms while getting to the safe spots. Bear in mind that the body's AoE actually covers about a third of each race platform as well. Next is Sewage Eruption. This places three back-to-back -back AoEs under most of your party members' locations. While it's definitely easiest to just stack everyone up and then dodge along the grates and raised platforms, I accept the reality that in the Duty Finder, this will be a bit of a madhouse. Just try and stick to the very edges of the arena, the safe spaces on the arena, as you dodge and do your best not to wall people off as you drop these. There will be another Spoken Cataract right after this as well, so be mindful of that. After a bunch of Flood, Sights, and a room-wide AoE, the Hippocampus will use Dissociation to do a half-room AoE. It will also jump to a raised platform and use Shockwave. Either make sure the Shockwave knockback sends you to a side of the room that's safe from the Dissociation AoE, or just use Knockback Resist and stand in the safe spot to begin with. It should be up for every single Shockwave. With that, we're close to done with every mechanic. The waters will recede and the hippocampus will use dissociation again. Once the head picks a half of the room, the boss will use sewage eruption. Place and dodge these on the half side of the room that is safe from the dissociation. Right after these is coherence again, and it works the same as before. Tank run away in mid, party stack for damage. After a couple more murky depths and a double impact, the fight is just on repeat at this point. Just keep a cool head and you won't be washed away. That's going to be a wrap for my guide to the second circle in Asphodelos on the normal difficulty. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned for more Endwalker raid guides, videos, all sorts of things.
from its body, and it uses that to its advantage, both here and in future Next is the Hippocampus's main mechanic, Sewage Deluge. This will do some room-wide damage and after a short delay, cover the majority of the room in water. The only safe locations here will be the raised platforms and the grates that connect them. Touching the water will just give you a dropsy dot. It does about 8k per tick, so it's survivable, but not ideal. For positioning here, I'd recommend letting the healers have the south center grate, with the DPS spread along the two southwest and southeast raised platforms. Tanks can use the north connecting grate and those raised platforms how they choose. It's not mandatory to set things up this way, in fact there's definitely some better ways to set it up, but at the very minimum this helps for healing and mechanics a lot.
Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to my guide to Pandemonium Asphodelos Third Circle on the normal difficulty. If you'd like to skip to any specific mechanic, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. This encounter will see you face off against an ancient phoenix, or... Phoenix? The phoenix. The wall is death, and unlike most normal modes, it might actually behoove you to set some markers. You don't need them, but having cardinal directions marked around where you see here should help a ton. Also, assign each tank to be responsible for two cardinal directions. I like to have the main tank responsible for north and east, and the off tank responsible for south and west, and we'll explain that later. The start of the fight will immediately introduce the Phoenix's experimental fire plume mechanic. This attack has two different possible outcomes depending on what animation the Phoenix uses. Now, if you see a, see a single giant ball of fire come out of the Phoenix, then it means the center of the room is dangerous, so get towards the edge. If you see a swirling circle of smaller flame balls, that means it's going to be rotating AoEs that start on the outside and end in the center of the room. It's a fire plume mechanic. This attack has two different possible outcomes depending on what animation the Phoenix uses. Now, if you see a single giant ball of fire come out of the Phoenix, then it means the center of the room is dangerous, so get towards the edge. If you see a swirling circle of smaller flame balls, that means it's going to be rotating AoEs that start on the outside and end in the center of the room. It's optical sights from Cruise Chaser if you've ever done that fight before, essentially. The first two attacks in the fight will be one of each of these in a random order. After that, the Phoenix teaches you its basics. Scorch Exaltation is a room-wide AoE, and Heart of Condemnation is its tank buster. This actually targets both tanks, and it's an AoE, so they should stand near the front of the boss, but away from each other, and both pop a cooldown. Next is one of the Phoenix's most important mechanics, Darkened Fire. This will summon four Darkened Fire adds in a square pattern near the center of the room. Shortly after this, the Phoenix will mark four players with numbered Brighton Fires, hitting them one at a time with these AoEs. To kill the Darkened Fires, you need to hit them with a Bright Fire AoE. This is one of two points in the fight that has a decent potential to wipe the party. If a flame is left unkilled, it deals massive room-wide damage, and if two survive, it's definitely a wipe. To make things easy, have players stand on the cardinal markers that we set at the beginning near the center of the room. These spots actually hit two flames instead of one, so the room for error here is much, much higher than assigning one player to each flame. Don't worry about lining up the number of your flame with the number of the marker. Just make sure as many bright fires are between darkened fires as possible, and unless something goes horribly awry, you'll be all set. If one is missed, pop every shield and mitt you have immediately to help ensure survival. After this is left or right cinder wing. This just has the phoenix cleave whichever side is in the name of the ability. If it says right, then get to the phoenix's left side and vice versa. After this will be a dive bomb through the center of the room to watch out for before you actually go into Phoenix's ad phase. The boss will become untargetable and summon two sets of two sunbirds. The first set will spawn on the north and south side of the room with a large AoE indicator around them. That indicator itself doesn't do anything for now, but you need to make sure they do not die too close together. If they die together in that circle, the phase is going to wipe you at the end. Have your assigned tanks pull them slightly away from the starting point and kill them off. This is what we did the assignments for earlier. The adds do also do frontal or rear AoEs to look out for. Dodging them's easy, but bear in mind they can't be moved while they're casting those skills. So if they're not in a great position, don't overkill them while they're doing it. After you kill the first two, another pair will appear on the east and west side, which you can handle the same way. All the while, there is some room-wide damage going out on occasion, and honestly, the tank autos here are nothing to scoff at, so make sure no one's health slips while you're taking care of these adds. Defeat them all before the Phoenix's gauge fills to full. Once all four are defeated, the boss will use Flames of Undeath, dealing some party damage and resurrecting all of the Sunbirds. If there are any too close to each other, they will give the boss damage stacks and fill the gauge, resulting in a wipe. Just don't let that happen. Then, survive the Phoenix's dead rebirth AoE and move on to phase 2. For the rest of the encounter, the Phoenix will be surrounded by its four fledglings that were revived after you killed them. These will fire attacks very frequently at the second tank, so be prepared for them to take damage for the rest of the fight. Pop short cooldowns such as Heart of Corundum and Holy Sheltron as frequently as possible. The next new mechanic is Fledgling Flight. 
The four fledglings will stop attacking the second tank and one by one appear in the arena. They will then do conal AoEs in the same order they appear. To dodge this, get behind wherever the second fledgling appears, and after the first one goes off, get to the newly created safe spot. Super easy. At the end of this will be Experimental Char Plume. This is just a spread AoE on every player, so spread without being hit by the remaining conal AoEs. Next up is Devouring Brand. This summons four line AoEs from each cardinal side of the room that gradually merge towards the center. When they all reach each other, they will briefly expand before dissipating a few seconds later. Just don't stand in any of this. There's fortunately no other important mechanics that happen as you're doing this, so it doesn't matter which quadrant you go to. Right after the first Devouring Brand is Searing Breeze. This will just drop one AoE under every player's feet. Later in the fight, it will begin dropping three back to back to back, however, so be prepared. After this, you've seen every mechanic. They just get remixed together in new ways. Char Plume will be followed by one of the two Fire Plume mechanics, and the Dive Bombs are going to be accompanied by spread AoEs as well. There will also be more Darkened Fires, as threatening as the last, and these always come right after a Devouring Brand. It's likely because of positioning that many people will be standing together with Bright Fires, and there might be a bit of confusion, but just make sure that at least one person is at least hitting one flame, or better yet, that people are in those double up spots, as many of them as possible, and this shouldn't pose any issue. Just keep repeating everything until the phoenix falls for good. Thank you for watching my guide to the third circle of Asphodelos on the normal difficulty. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned. We'll have more Endwalker content coming aplenty for you to
Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to my guide to Pandemonium Asphodelos 4th Circle on the normal difficulty. If you'd like to skip to any specific mechanics, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. This encounter will see you face off against Hesperos to some heckin' good tunes. Just note that the wall is death and we can actually get started. First are Hesperos' basic skills. Elegant Evisceration is his tank buster and it's actually AoE, so stay away from other players with this. His roomwide AoE is Decolation, so just keep an eye out for that, especially with some other attacks that also do roomwide damage. Shortly into the fight, Hesperos reveals his primary mechanic, Setting the Scene. This will cover anywhere from 1 to 4 quadrants of the room, depending on the phase in the fight, with a large cloak. This will transform any affected quadrant into a new terrain with a well of elemental ether in the center. The cloak, the terraforming, and the quadrant itself don't deal damage and are completely safe to stand in. But if you stand directly in the center of the elemental well, you will take a substantial amount of damage over time, so avoid stepping on that at any cost. Each elemental well has its own effect that will be activated when Hespero casts Pinox. Let's cover each of them now so you can recognize them for later. The first setting the scene will just be a thunder well. Shortly after casting Pinox, a storm will swell up in the center of the room before doing massive proximity damage. The falloff for this does not kick in until just about the edge of the arena, so if you're any closer than the cardinal edges or roughly where you see me in the corner, you're likely dead. Make it a priority to immediately get to the wall when you identify the Thunder Pinox. The second scene will be a water well. This will instead do a knockback from the center of the room shortly after Pinox casts. Just stand close to the center and try to avoid being knocked over any elemental wells on an eye out for that, especially with some other attacks. First are Hespero's basic skills. Elegant Evisceration is his tank buster, and it's actually AoE, so stay away from other players with this. His roomwide AoE is Decolation, so just keep an eye out for that, especially with some other attacks that also do roomwide damage. Shortly into the fight, Hesperos reveals his primary mechanic, Setting the Scene. This will cover anywhere from 1 to 4 quadrants of the room, depending on the phase in the fight, with a large cloak. This will transform any affected quadrant into a new terrain with a well of elemental ether in the center. The cloak, the terraforming, and the quadrant itself don't deal damage and are completely safe to stand in. But if you stand directly in the center of the elemental well, you will take a substantial amount of damage over time, so avoid stepping on that at any cost. Each elemental well has its own effect that will be activated when Hespero casts Pinox. Let's cover each of them now so you can recognize them for later. The first setting the scene will just be a Thunder Well. Shortly after casting Pinox, a storm will swell up in the center of the room before doing massive proximity damage. The falloff for this does not kick in until just about the edge of the arena, so if you're any closer than the cardinal edges or roughly where you see me in the corner, you're likely dead. Make it a priority to immediately get to the wall when you identify the Thunder Pinox. The second scene will be a water well. This will instead do a knockback from the center of the room shortly after Pinox casts. Just stand close to the center and try to avoid being knocked over any elemental wells on the arena, but more importantly, don't go into the wall. The third scene will be a poison well. This will hit every player with an AoE, so spread out and avoid overlapping any of them. Simple. And the final scene is a fire well. This is a split damage AoE, so stack up for the damage. Early in the fight, you will just get one scene to deal with, but eventually you'll have three or four on the arena at the same time. When this happens, you'll need to watch which well activates when Hesperos casts Pinox and then react accordingly. There is some semblance of a pattern here, and we'll cover that later in the guide. The start of the fight will see a Thunder Well, a Roomwide AoE, and then a Water Well. After the Water Well, Hesperos will use Hell Skewer. This is just a line AoE in the direction Hesperos turns, so get away from it. After a couple more attacks, you will get three scenes set up at once. One water, one thunder, and one poison. Remember, you can stand in these squares, so don't feel confined to the untransformed one. Here you'll need to pay attention to which well activates first by watching the animations. It will always be either a thunder or water well first, followed by the poison well, and then the remaining one. You just have to do these mechanics one by one. There will be some hell skewers here and there, just be mindful of those. The next mechanic is Blood Rake. 
This does some damage to the entire party and grants Esparos access to one of two skills. Balone Coils will come first and summon four Meteor Markers that each require at least one person to stand in them or they'll blow up on the entire party. You'll notice that they have the different role symbols for Tank Healer and DPS and that they also have a red X going through them. This means that any player who matches these roles should not stand in that tower as they will take significantly more damage and get a bone stack if they even live. So DPS stand in either the tank or healer towers and tanks and healers take the DPS towers. The other mechanic will come a bit later, but it's Balone Bursts. This summons eight orbs that each tether to a different player. These orbs also have those roll symbols with the X's through them and tether to a player of that same role. Basically, if you touch your own orb or any orb with the wrong symbol, it'll be a similar problem to if you stood in the wrong meteor in Balone Coils, so you just don't want to do it. Just have DPS pop the tank and healer orbs, while the tanks and healers exclusively pop the DPS orbs. When you do pop an orb, it will deal significant damage and give you a stack of thrice come ruin. It's okay so long as you have enough health to eat more than a single orb, but if you eat three, you'll be killed after a short delay. So long as the DPS handle the tank healer orbs and the tank healers handle the DPS orbs though, everyone should have a clean one stack each. After the first Blood Rake mechanic, Hesperos will begin using Shift. This attack will be accompanied by a cardinal direction in the name, such as Westerly Shift or Easterly Shift, and a symbol will appear at that same side of the arena as a visual indicator. If the symbol is a sword, it will do a large cleave through the center of the room, so stand on the sword's flanks to dodge this. If the symbol is a cape, it will do a massive knockback, able to be resisted, but significant all the same. If you do get knocked back, ensure you stand close to the cape and aim towards the center of the room. He will do three of these back to back the first time, and the third one will be random between sword and cape, so be wary of this. After the other blood rake mechanic,